and welcome to the special 2015 wrap-up for the Bogosity Podcast. This is your host, Shane Killian, and there's been a lot of Bogosity this year, so we'll summarize it all and announce our 2015 Idiot of the Year. One thing we've seen is a lot of attacks on free speech on public campuses. This has always been a problem, but while things have actually been improving in that regard, we've seen a bit of a shift in how the fight is happening. Generally, as administrators have become more allowing of free speech, more and more students have been protesting speech that they don't like. As Robbie Sove of Reason Magazine has summarized, Recent surveys of student and faculty attitudes towards free expression and the state of affairs on campus suggest that some members of the campus community are eager to squelch speech that offends them. So he asked several activists what they thought of this. Here's what Christina Hoff Sommers had to say, quote, I have never seen anything like what is happening today. In the past, students who disagreed with my critique of hardline feminism would either ignore my talks or come to spar and debate. Today, they organize boycotts. Why? Because I might give them PTSD. Campus activists organize safe spaces where students could flee if they were panic-stricken by my arguments. Angry flyers were pasted on the walls. Free speech does not mean hate speech. There was yelling and hooting throughout my talk. When a kindly philosophy professor stood up and urged students to be civil, he was jeered and mocked, and someone in the crowd ordered him to sit down. Though I was not censored or silenced, the students' antics did create a hostile environment for free expression. Such antics, and worse, are now common on campuses throughout the country. College deans, earned on by student safe spacers, risk-averse attorneys, and officials in the education department have formed an axis of oppression. Together, they are quietly amending the Constitution and creating their own definition of harassment. They are replacing the First Amendment with their own little codes and guidelines. Freedom of expression is being eclipsed by the right not to be made uncomfortable. Due process is treated as a barrier to justice rather than its essence. Armies of gender apparatchiks are monitoring and policing speech, ideas, humor, sexuality, even clapping. Orwell's Junior Anti-Sex League has set up shop right in our midst. Here's what Angus Johnston had to say, quote, The more insidious attacks are the rhetorical ones, in which students' advocacy of their own views is condemned as censorship of others. It is not censorship or silencing or totalitarianism to shout at a professor or to call a fellow student racist or to demand that a university president resign. It's speech, robust, vigorous speech that falls squarely within the best traditions of political dissent and student protest, that so many self-proclaimed free speech advocates fail to understand that is deeply disappointing. Samantha Harris, quote, Policies that are not necessarily restrictive on their face can still be applied in a restrictive way, which is another problem we see happening on campus, particularly when the federal government's unprecedented intervention in the university's handling of sexual assault and sexual harassment claims. We have seen too many universities investigating and even punishing clearly protected speech, including the germane speech of faculty in the classroom, under the guise of addressing harassment. With regard to student attitudes about speech, it's also a mixed bag. On the one hand, this fall has brought a great display of students across the country exercising their right to protest and demonstrate. And yet, too many of these same protesters have been issuing demands that, if met, would undermine others' right to free speech, such as the Amherst protesters' demand that the college punish students who posted All Lives Matter posters. Anecdotally, it does feel as though FIRE encounters more demand for censorship coming from students themselves than we did when I first started FIRE 10 years ago, when censorship seemed to be driven more by administrators. And finally, Jane S. Shaw, quote, Public universities come under the aegis of the First Amendment, and when they violate it, they don't have a leg to stand on. Private universities don't have to meet that standard, they are more like private businesses in control of what goes on within their walls, but bad publicity does hurt their reputations. Unfortunately, most students 18 to 22 years old are not very thoughtful about free speech. The term free speech sounds good, hate speech sounds bad, and most students don't understand how prohibiting something bad can undermine something good. Add to that the pervasive effort to protect selected victims and throw in some weak-willed administrators and you have the situation that's been in the news in recent days. 
But most faculty recognize the importance of free speech. Along with the publicity, they will help campuses calm down and restore what freedom has been lost. I'm not as confident of the administrators, however. Eric Posner even got biggest bug on emitter for saying that college students are children who must be protected from bad speech. At the same time, the social justice warriors cranked their bogosity up to 11 as they cyberbullied an 11-year-old girl who braided her hair, jumped all over Richard Dawkins and others for their observation that we are all Africans, and even issued bomb threats against both a Gamergate bar meetup and a debate with the Society of Professional Journalists about ethics in gaming journalism. Sarah Silverman made up a bogus story about being a victim of the gender wage gap, and when she was called on it, said that her critics were maniacs. A writer for Jezebel said that air conditioning was a conspiracy of the patriarchy. And Anita Sarkeesian, Zoe Quinn, and others managed to get an audience with the UN and convince them to advocate for free speech restrictions because they're just oh-so-oppressed and other people have all this privilege without even a hint of irony. We even saw Senator Tammy Baldwin claim that the First Amendment doesn't apply to individuals. We did see good things happen in the wake of the Snowden revelations in the form of more strong encryption. The popularity of encrypted apps like Signal and WhatsApp soared, and Apple and Google have acted to make sure the latest versions of their operating system could be strongly secured. But it didn't take long for the statists to start complaining about it. British Prime Minister David Cameron advocated the banning of all forms of encryption the government couldn't access. The government pressured PayPal to stop accepting payments from cloud service Mega because their files were strongly encrypted. A library system which would have set up their computers to connect over the Tor network was scuttled by the DHS. Congress passed the size of surveillance bill after stripping all privacy protections from it and sticking it as a rider on must-pass legislation. France wants to ban Tor and public Wi-Fi. David Cameron, speechwriter, even said that tech companies were, quote, helping tech-savvy jihadists. It would be one thing if they could show that they can protect us by accessing our encrypted data, but they can't even show that they can protect us by accessing unencrypted data, given that those behind the Boston Marathon bombing, the Paris attacks, and the San Bernardino attacks communicated in the clear, and the FBI and DHS were shown to be 0 for 41 in predicting imminent terrorist attacks. Of course, the FBI's bite mark analysis was shown to be complete pseudoscience this past year, and they even admitted that their hair analysis is severely flawed. And yet, FBI Director James Comey says that encryption is the reason terrorists have eluded the FBI. Bogus! But we do need these strong encryption apps, as evidenced by Lenovo and others sticking onto their own computers software that breaks HTTPS encryption, and Samsung disabling Windows Update. We also saw how export restrictions on cryptography dating back to the 1990s were causing security problems today with the Freak and Logjam attacks. Several big media companies attacked VPNs, saying they violated copyright law. At the same time, a judge said that the NSA spy program was so secret the courts weren't even allowed to say why it couldn't be challenged. Cisco even resorted to sending hardware to bogus addresses to stop the NSA from intercepting them and implanting spyware. We also saw once again how vulnerable our information is. Millions of records were taken in the hack of the Office of Personnel Management, 100,000 taxpayers had their information stolen from the IRS, a lot of Experian records were stolen which could result in identity thefts, and a free internet hosting provider was hacked, revealing millions of passwords that were stored completely in the clear. And as 2015 came to a close, the records of every single registered voter in the United States were stolen and put online. But in the meantime, a huge LastPass hack didn't endanger LastPass customers. But that's because LastPass uses the very kind of encryption the government wants to ban. Some of the biggest computer security experts in the world got together to release a report showing how dangerous these proposals to backdoor encryption are. And we did, thankfully, see the Department of Defense come out in favor of strong encryption. So there's hope at least. Advocates of net neutrality got their way when the FCC redefined broadband and voted to regulate the internet like a public utility. 
instead of, you know, busting up the monopolies and allowing competition. But they did need to do something, since several ISPs were caught, red-handed, slowing down connections to Netflix to encourage people to buy their TV service. And as a leaked Comcast document showed, it wasn't about congestion at all, but limiting the competition. Of course, there was plenty of good ol' anti-science to keep us busy. Anti-vax lies continued to claim lives, including a measles outbreak at Disneyland and the first American to die from measles since 2003. Anti-GMO activists tried to get GMOs outlawed in Scotland. A teacher at the University of Toronto taught her students that vaccinations cause autism and that chickenpox, measles, and cancer are good. Oh, and homeopathy works because quantum mechanics. And the WHO report on bacon and cancer was misrepresented basically everywhere to claim that bacon was as carcinogenic as smoking when that isn't in any way what it said. And there was all the misinformation about e-cigarettes, from anti-vax level fear-mongering about formaldehyde, which wasn't anywhere near a dangerous level and only present when the temperature was turned up so high the vapes tasted horrible and a Connecticut crackdown on e-cigs that was deemed to be not quite enough by pundits who say they're just as bad as tobacco smoke, which they absolutely and objectively are not. Nowhere near. Meanwhile, the government's war on entrepreneurship continued unabated. Two teens who offered a snow shoveling service in New York were shut down by the cops. France basically went to war with Uber, with taxi drivers protesting Uber, rioting and causing violence, as reported on in part by Courtney Love, who was caught in the middle of it. And French officials said that the solution was to crack down on Uber, not violent taxi drivers. Not that cops themselves had anything to worry about. A cop who stole nude photos from a woman's phone went unpunished, as did the ones who threw a flash grenade into a toddler's crib. Meanwhile, citizens who video police in the course of doing their jobs continue to be harassed. The judicial system showed once again that judges are nothing but politicians in robes. Case in point, the Kim.com trial, where the U.S. courts found the dot-com was a fugitive even though he'd never even set foot in the U.S., and therefore they could take his money and prevent him from hiring attorneys to defend himself in his home country of New Zealand. Eventually, the New Zealand court said that .com could be extradited to the U.S., but .com has the right of appeal, which means the case will extend into 2016. We also saw the obvious kangaroo court that was the Ross Ulbricht trial, the man sentenced to life in prison without parole for the heinous crime of running an e-commerce site that the government can't regulate. And it's so horrible because so many people were buying drugs, an act that harms no one. Ultimately, Ulbricht's conviction and sentencing, as confirmed by Judge Catherine Forrest's own words, was based on allegations that he hired assassins to kill his enemies, something he wasn't even charged with and that no evidence was presented to corroborate. But Judge Forrest allowed it, insisting it wasn't prejudicial, and then turned around and said directly that it was the main reason for her giving Ulbricht a life sentence. No matter what else happened, Judge Forrest has at least secured her status as one of the worst human beings alive. But despite the fact that there's no evidence that Ulbricht ever caused the first bit of harm to anyone, the FBI agents who stole millions of dollars in Bitcoin during the course of their investigation of Silk Road got off much more lightly. Venezuela's socialism put the country into complete ruination, as the country nationalized the food industry, which, of course, resulted in no food on the shelves and the inevitable rioting. But President Maduro blamed it on a U.S. conspiracy and a war with evil capitalists, while one Venezuelan governor said that the people could just eat fried rocks. Venezuelans apparently didn't buy it, since they voted out the socialists in a landslide. As usual, we gave the news media a pounding for the horrible job they do, the most egregious examples being the Washington Post lying about Amtrak's funding and the New York Times spreading lies about New York's nail salons. Of course, it should come as no surprise that politicians and political candidates spewed their share of bogosity this year. Barack Obama in his State of the Union address claimed credit for job growth that, according to the BLS, didn't happen. Donald Trump regularly made an ass of himself by calling for long-disproven and completely laughable policies like building a wall to keep out immigrants. Bernie Sanders said that children were starving because there were too many different kinds of deodorant. 
Dianne Feinstein and Susan Collins asked the FDA to start regulating soap using food babesque bogus scare tactics against perfectly safe ingredients like propylene glycol. Hillary Clinton kept evading all questions about her email server scandals, including responding to one question about whether she wiped it with, What, you mean like with a cloth? She also lied about charter schools only taking the best kids, and she called out the gig economy with the horrible realization that more than one in three American workers are freelancers and saying how horrible it was that people could easily work for Uber. Bernie Sanders also complained about Uber when, as it turns out, 100% of his taxi budget was spent not on taxis, but Uber rides. And Ben Carson just said all sorts of crazy things, from statements supporting young earth creationism to the claim that Joseph built the pyramids of Giza to store grain. Of course, 2015 had its share of IP bogosity. I mentioned earlier how media companies insisted that VPNs violated copyrights. The Total Wipes music group tried to get pages taken down about how to use PGP on a Mac and how to download Skype, Java, and many other pieces of software claiming they infringed on music copyrights. The EFF busted a patent on podcasting. The MPAA tried to use copyright laws to kill domain name privacy. A researcher who exposed a security flaw in Impero Education Pro, software which is used throughout the British school system, received a copyright threat from Impero. It hit a bit close to home as well when our friends at the Superplex Brothers podcast had their new t-shirts taken down from Teespring because they used something resembling the Nintendo logo. When that isn't copyrighted or even something you can copyright. We saw similarly bogus behavior when Getty Images tried to go after 2600 Magazine for ink blotches which aren't copyrightable and they got from somewhere else in the first place anyway. And Subaru went after a WordPress blog for infringement when the blog was an entry in Subaru's traveling trainer program, earning Subaru an entry into WordPress's Hall of Shame. And all of that was in the same week. Oh, and then there was the case of PETA suing on behalf of a monkey who took a selfie, claiming that the monkey had a copyright, and of course, PETA, who has absolutely nothing to do with the monkey, is, of course, the company who should get the money from it. We also had Anne Frank Fonz trying to get Anne Frank's father declared a co-author of her famous diary solely to stop it from becoming public domain at the start of 2016. We did have a few bits of good news, though. Google Books, which makes a lot of copyrighted books searchable, was affirmed as fair use by the courts. The laughable copyright for Happy Birthday to You was taken from Warner Chappell, although unfortunately not declared fully public domain and a judge said that it's okay for people who aren't pirating content to bypass DRM. And we had another cause to celebrate this year. Same-sex marriage was legalized countrywide. Congratulations to all the happy couples who officially tied the knot this year. Although it is disheartening that, after coming out of a record-breaking 2014, there was only one recipient of the Silver Clue on this year for a beautiful demonstration of how gerrymandering works. Well, after all this, it's time to determine who's going to be 2015's Idiot of the Year. Let's see who you nominated. Dave Turcotte nominated a particularly reprehensible anti-vaxxer. Here he is, joined by Jonathan Lochet. Hey everybody, Dave here, and I'm just going to do my nomination for Idiot of the Year. I am here with John, of course. Hey, what's up, everybody? Long time no see. In Dady duty. Now, our Idiot of the Year nomination, or my Idiot of the Year nomination, goes to Holly Singleton, who is the mother of Brisbane, and she's one of those parents who in decided to have a pox party. And for those of you who don't know, a pox party is basically when parents who are generally, I don't want to say skeptical, because that, that requires some form of intelligence, douchebags decide that they don't like vaccines and they're going to make their kids get the chicken pox intentionally. She ended up canceling her party, however, because her children were no longer contagious. However, uh, she had this to say on her Facebook account. And I warn you, this may actually get you pretty angry. Truth as I see it is too harsh for most to accept. Illness keeps population in control and is meant to eliminate the weak and build a stronger species. So, basically eugenics. Yeah. You know, normally the typical anti-vaxxer is just kind of like, 
scared for the safety of their children, even if they're not, you know, showcasing any kind of intelligence. Usually, usually the average anti-vaxxer is, uh, is at least operating under a sense of fear for their child's safety, even if it's completely misdirected. This particular person, on the other hand, is more than willing to put her and other people's children in danger just because. Yeah, I mean, this isn't almost idiot of the year where this is just pure evil yeah, in a sense. I would agree. This is just pure evil bullshit. And it's just a complete sense of negligence. And, oh, God. Thankfully, thankfully, other people have been giving her shit for this. But it just goes to show that anti-vaxxer bullshit is still very prominent, and not all of them operate under any sense of goodwill. Yeah, and you know, I remember pox parties being something of a thing when I was a kid growing up, but we were sort of that last generation of kids growing up before the chicken pox vaccine was introduced in the U.S., so at least back then there was some potential justification for that but now it's you have the vaccine it's available there's no reason for this or particularly if your justification is well we just have to thin the herd with disease yeah i mean for those of you who don't know uh john did say that pox parties were a thing for a long time but the vaccine for the chicken pox was finally brought to the u.s in 1995 japan had it as early as 1988 thanks u.s government but uh the idea is these people have decided not to catch up with the rest of us and it, it's absurd and the fact that you are so willing to not only put your own kids in danger, to put other people's kids in danger, and to be so adamant about your idea that, well, illness eliminates the weak, shows not only are you an idiot, but you're just downright cold-blooded. And I think that is a perfect candidate for Idiot of the Year. Tough to disagree there, Dave. Tough to disagree. But now let's hear from Charles Thomas. Hello, Shane, and everyone out there listening in Bogosity Land. It is me, Duke CT, with a brand new mic. Hopefully you guys are liking it right now. And anyway, get back to the point. My nomination for Idiot of the Year has to be the TSA. Now, some would say, why the TSA? I mean, they haven't done anything. You know, that's one of the main problems. They don't really stop terrorist attacks or anything else like that, but it's something that they just recently did. Before the year 2015 ended, they, <laughs> and you're gonna love this, boys and girls, the Department of Homeland Security basically is pushing for make IDs, you know, your ID, your driver's license, and etc. You can't fly with this. Within the United States, if you are in, say, Texas or Alaska, New Mexico, Missouri, Illinois, Washington, Oregon, Ohio, Montana, North Dakota, Arizona, and many other states, that you would have to get a passport, a passport to fly in the United States. Yes. All it is going to do is frustrate people. And it's going to have cause flight delays. And people say, well, oh, if you don't like somewhere, you can leave. Well, guess what? If you want to leave, if you want to be like, well, I don't like to be in Texas or New Mexico, you have to shell out, uh, I think, like 160 bucks to get a passport. And you know how long it takes to get a passport? It is by far the most insane hindrance on free travel in the United States. To me, Shane, this right here, the TSA, boys and girls, is the, and the Department of Homeland Security, I gotta put, no, that's two, so, look self, make sure this is, um, scripted next time, but, uh, anyway, I put the Department of Homeland Security and the TSA as my idiot of the year. Well, uh, have a happy new year, see y'all later, and hopefully, with this new mic, you guys won't hate me as much, anyway, peace. 
We also saw how the TSA considers a lot of perfectly innocent behavior patterns, and especially those associated with autism, to be evidence of suspected terrorism. And we also saw how TSA procedures let through 90% of weapons, including 50% of bombs, and how their secure luggage locks were easily hacked using nothing more than pictures from the internet. Oh, but don't worry, they did shut down an international airport for several hours to save everyone from dental supplies. And now, here's Jonathan Lochet. Alright, happy 2016, everyone. Uh, I want to give a special shout-out to Shane. Thanks again for having me on the podcast. And all of our other great co-hosts. I'm sure they had fun, interesting nominations for Idiot of the Year 2015 as well. So, 2015 is in the books. Another trip around the sun. Another 365 days closer to death. And another 365 days of the human race making complete asses of themselves. So, what happens when you combine Florida Man with the Nazis? You have my Idiot of the Year for 2015. Mr. Augustus Sol Invictus is attempting to run for the U.S. Senate as a libertarian in my home state of Florida. Uh, listeners of the podcast may remember him as the guy who admitted to drinking goat's blood at one point. But there's oh so, so much more to discuss. Uh, something that has gotten far less media attention but I feel is of much greater importance is that uh, at one point, Mr. Invictus openly advocated for a government-enforced eugenics program uh, from the treaties that is still on his official LinkedIn profile, and why I included uh, Sun Shane for his part of the show notes. And I quote, We have a duty to implement legislation to prevent the births of persons with mental retardation, inheritable diseases, severe physical handicaps, and psychological disorders. In other words... We have a duty to implement through state legislation an official eugenics program. Pretty cut and dry right there. Now, since then, Augustus Sol Invictus has added a half-hearted retraction to this paper, but that was only done after much criticism was levied at him from both uh, members within the Libertarian Party, various media outlets, and just folks with plain common decency. I also personally have a hard time believing this is a genuine attraction. Uh, I've included a copy of some of his early campaign material, and as you can see, it is rife with fascist and neo-Nazi imagery. In fact, it includes a literal fascist and perched eagle, two predominant symbols you see in fascism and neo-Nazi propaganda, particularly in Europe. So, for thinking that being libertarian means that we have to include government-forced eugenics, and we have to dress ourselves up as the Nazis, Augustus Sol Invictus is my nominee for Idiot of the Year 2015. Thank you, cheers, and let's hope there's more freedom in 2016 at the end of the year than there was at the beginning. Thank you. And a lot of listeners nominated Salon.com. In January, Salon's Mike LaSusa called Honduras a nightmare libertarian project, even though Honduras ranks 116 on the Index of Economic Freedom, and it's been ruled by nationalist liberals for decades. In December, Simon Malloy deliberately quote mined Charles Koch to distort his views on leaving choice to consumers instead of the government into seeming like advocating rule by the rich elite. That was just what we covered in the podcast, but... Boy, did the nominations for Salon come in. There's their 11 ways to test if libertarians are hypocrites, which should really be called 11 ways Salon is clueless of both libertarianism and history, which really seems to be indicative of any Salon article, including Rand Paul is just this desperate, why his pathetic lies about the safety net are so destructive, in which they don't do anything resembling a refutation, just repeat the same long debunked points all over again. They went after Charles Koch again in Charles Koch's brazen lie, I'm not powerful, I'm just a humble classical liberal, where they completely failed to answer his question about, if he's so influential, why do so few of the policies he advocates get passed? Good question. Salon didn't even try to answer it. They just bleated on about how money buys politicians. We have even another of those How I Grew Up articles from someone who clearly doesn't even understand the difference between conservatism and libertarianism. Another from Simon Malloy was Rand Paul, dorm room philosopher, why his slavery nonsense is so outrageous. 
in which he calls the idea of the taxation, a claim over the fruits of some of your labor, is slavery, a dumb argument. It's bad, etc. But it doesn't even come close to refuting the basic point. If someone can force you to work and give the proceeds to them, how are you not their slave? It's a long-standing question, and no answer seems to be forthcoming, least of all from Salon. We also have things like libertarianism is for white men, and why it's a waste of everyone's time to think that technological innovations will improve the environment, even though they always have. No, this is almost a religion, thinking that entrepreneurs are supermen who only want what's best for us, plus they might not agree with us about what problems need solving. Not at all like government, you see. In fact, they even called all of this techno-libertarianism socially destructive, because it's done for all these horrible evil profits. And Salon.com isn't? They're all volunteers? All the money from the advertisements on their site is being donated to charity? Come on, after all that, there's no way that Salon.com could possibly avoid being named 2015's Idiot of the Year! So that wraps up this end, end edition of the Bogosity Podcast and another year of being bewildered at Bogosity. I hope you enjoy 2015, and despite the fact that it'll be another presidential election year, let's look to 2016 with optimism. Thanks to my co-hosts, thanks to everyone who contributed to the podcast, thanks to all of our donors and patrons, and above all, thank you for just listening. We'll be back on January 11th for the first official podcast of 2016. Until then, here's a quote from Clarence Darrow. You can only protect your liberties in this world by protecting the other man's freedom. You can only be free if I am free. The Bogosity Podcast is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution on Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Bogosity.